Well, good morning. It's uh, certainly a, a pleasure to be here for this uh, wonderful event. And thanks to, uh, to Kate and uh, Hussein and uh, Jim Babb for organizing this wonderful event and providing an excuse for all these uh, uh, former students and collaborators of uh, Alex to uh, gather here for this, uh, this event. Uh, and I'm sorry that, uh, that my, one of my collaborators, uh, Zong Chao Yan, uh, he, uh, a former student of mine who's uh, worked with uh, Alex and is responsible for much of the recent uh, high precision calculations that I'm going to be talking about uh, in connection with uh, lithium and three electron systems uh, is not here. He should certainly be um, w uh, participating in this event. Uh, let me begin though with some personal reminiscences about my uh, early days with, uh, with Alex. I actually, uh, my, uh, uh, it, uh, interactions with him began at the, when I started my PhD project with Morris Cohen, who uh, was a former um, uh, postdoc with Alex when he was still uh, in Belfast, and I had the opportunity to do my uh, degree with him at uh, uh, York University, and then he pointed me in the direction of working with, uh, with Alex, and at first I thought I was going to be going to uh, Queen's University, but before I left Canada, Alex left for Harvard. And so to my great surprise, I find my, found myself coming here rather than, than uh, to Ireland. And uh, there was a great group of uh, other students there at that time. And uh, I thought that it might be uh, a good idea to provide an opportunity for some social interactions. And so I suggested forming a poker club. And I was delighted when uh, Alex uh, was quite interested in, in playing poker and uh, um, uh, joined in, and so we, uh, we had this group. There was uh, Michael uh, Jameson, who's who's here. Arthur uh, Allison, of course, Ray Flannery uh, was was in that group, and Chris Botcher, who unfortunately died a number of years ago. It's a great loss to the uh, to the community. He was probably the most brilliant of the uh, of that group. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so we we, we met uh, regularly to uh, to play poker. And uh, just, uh, I was interested in uh, Jane Fox's co uh, comments on uh, Alex's eyebrows. Of course, he was uh, careful to control his eyebrows while playing poker. And uh, let me see if I've got some pictures here. Uh, reinterpretation, uh, the one on the, uh, on the left, that's uh, Alex uh, placing a bet. Uh, the, the one in the middle is, uh, is Alex uh, bluffing. And, and the one on the, on the right is Alex winning the pot. <clears throat> well, just to give some idea of the enormity of the field that I've been asked to, to cover uh, this morning in just a, a few minutes, uh, this is, this is the, the Handbook of Atomic Molecular and Optical Physics, some 1,500 pages. Uh, containing uh, 80, uh, almost 90 chapters with 115 authors. And I would say about half of them are associated with uh, Alex in one way or another, and the other half are experimentalists. So the, uh, that gives some idea of the, the, the range uh, of uh, Alex's uh, influence. And so I'll have to pick and choose uh, and just try to uh, hit a few of them. Oh, this is going the wrong way. OK, here we are. Um, so as, a, as an outline of what I'm going to try and cover this morning, uh, I'll start off with a sort of pedagogical introduction to dipole response theory for those of you who might not be uh, familiar with this, uh, and then continue on to uh, applications to properties of atoms and molecules, and then I'll talk more particularly about high precision variational calculations leading into asymptotic expansions, uh, I'll say a very little a bit uh, about 1 over uh, Z expansion theory, which is actually the topic of my uh, PhD thesis with, uh, with Morris Cohen, relativistic quantum electrodynamic effects, and then uh, this a very interesting recent topic of uh, isotope shifts and their applications to the determination of the properties of halo nuclei. Uh, and then finally, so I'm also supposed to talk about molecules, so I'll, I'll have to keep it to the simplest examples of molecules, uh, H2+, plus, just to show what is possible. What are the limits of what we know uh, about um, atoms and molecules? 
and at least uh, uh, define some parameters for what might ultimately be possible for more complex systems. So the, the, uh, the idea is, uh, right, let's begin by considering an atom or molecule oscillating with a, an electric field. The, um, of, of course, you can write a real field as the sum of positive and negative frequency uh, uh, complex components. And then, the, so the interaction of the atom with the, with the, uh, with the field is, is, the, is just the, uh, the dipole interaction term. Uh, and so the problem then uh, to be solved is to uh, solve the time-dependent Schrodinger equation with these uh, time-dependent interaction terms uh, driving the system. And uh, the, uh, the, the key to finding a solution to this, at least in terms of the uh, lowest order response, is to substitute into the uh, time uh, into the uh, uh, substitute uh, to uh, write the solution as a perturbation expansion with the electric field strength playing the role of a perturbation parameter. Uh, and of course, in, in higher order, you then get uh, uh, higher order interaction effects. But in the, this is in the uh, in the uh, case of uh, the uh, linear term, the zero order term is, the, is that without the, the field, and then we have a first order perturbation uh, equation. Um, and if we uh, regard this as a field as being switched on adiabatically and look for steady state solutions, then uh, we, uh, um, the time derivative just brings down factors of, of the energy or the energy plus or minus the frequency of the oscillating field. And now we have two options to solve this system. Uh, we can just solve the first order uh, equation directly. And this is the, uh, for, and you can find analytic solutions, for example, for hydrogen, uh, a variety of approximation methods for many electron atoms. Uh, and this was all pioneered by uh, Delgarno uh, in the uh, early uh, years at, uh, at Belfast and then uh, at Harvard, uh, Delgarno and, uh, and uh, Victor. Uh, George Victor is also a member of the Poker Club. I didn't, didn't mention him. Um, and, uh, and then Michael Jameson. Uh, it's uh, recently been applied, uh, extended to, uh, to uh, configuration interaction representations for many electron atoms, density functional theory, uh, Chu and Delgarno, 2004. So this, this is still an ongoing field of, of development of finding ways of solving these, uh, uh, these perturbation equations. So that's, that's one method, is that just by solving the perturbation equation uh, directly. Uh, the second is to multiply through by the resolvent operator, the reciprocal of this operator on the left. Multiply through and insert a complete set of states. Uh, and if you do that, uh, you then obtain this, uh, 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 this resolvent operator uh, representation as the sum over intermediate states uh, of the, uh, for the, the first order perturbation, the solution to the first order perturbation equation. And so the second order energy shift is then just the matrix element of that, of this, the plus minus solution. We have to add both because it's a real field. So, uh, by, uh, so we've got the plus, uh, uh, to get, to regain our, uh, the, uh, the real field that's driving the atom. And so this then leads to the definition of the frequency dependent polarizability uh, containing these two terms, one from the positive frequency component and the other the negative frequency component. Uh, and so then just bring this over a common denominator, and then we obtain this uh, characteristic form with the dipole matrix element squared in the numerator and, the di and, these, and these quadratic terms in the denominator. So the reason that you get the uh, En minus E naught squared minus h bar omega squared in the denominator just comes from adding up the positive and negative frequency components. And so this is useful provided you're far from a resonance. Uh, and of course, the, the oscillator, this just defines the, uh, this product of matrix elements, defines the oscillator strength. Um, and so we now again have two options for what to do with this. We can use experimental data for the oscillator strengths, thereby relating the, uh, 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 this to uh, observational data, or introduce a, dis, uh, a discrete variational basis set to construct a pseudo spectrum. And this is the, the key idea that I learned from uh, Alex in, the, uh, in those uh, uh, years that I, I spent here, uh, to represent the complete set of intermediate states. And this is a very powerful technique. Uh, you just diagonalize the Hamiltonian in a, a discrete variational basis set that then uh, gives, uh, as you progressively enlarge the basis set, each one of these uh, eigenvalues progressively moves inexorably downward. 
but it can never cross through the exact eigenvalue. And so they form uh, upper, each one as a variational upper bound to the uh, corresponding energies. But then you also get these ones up here lying in the continuum. And so these represent whole, uh, that, uh, a range of states in the continuum. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, in terms of mathematical theory, this is a, a, a Sturmian basis set. Um, the, and so by summing over these uh, discrete states, you replace the infinite sum over the bound states together with an integration over the continuum. So it's a, a great computational advantage uh, to uh, use these discrete variational basis sets. Uh, and so you replace the actual spectrum by the, the sum over these pseudo states to obtain the alpha tilde. This, this is the discrete variational representation for the frequency dependent polarizability, uh, which then tends in the limit as the number uh, of, of pseudo states goes to infinity to the, uh, to the correct answer, provided the basis set is complete. And there's also a variational justification for this. You can actually construct this uh, variational function and find and it's the extrema just correspond to these same values for the coefficients that uh, appear here. Uh, <clears throat> this is a, a sample calculation just to, to show that it, uh, it really works. You can actually solve the first order perturbation equation for the ground state of, uh, of hydrogen. Here it is, it's just a, a, a simple function. It's a, this is like a, a, a P state with a 2R plus R squared. And, and so the exact uh, dipole polarizability is, uh, is then nine halves in units of uh, Bohr radius cubed. So, uh, but instead of solving the perturbation equation, you could also construct a trial function with B1 and B2 being the uh, variational parameters, find the extrema, and, uh, and so you can actually find an analytic expression. Now we regarded, instead of having the exact uh, minus r, I put in a parameter here, minus lambda r, and then we'll let lambda vary and see what happens. Uh, and so here's the uh, variational polarizability for, the, uh, for hydrogen with the, uh, the first extremum appearing. Uh, and so the, whatever value of lambda, you get a lower bound to the polarizability uh, with the exact value appearing here for lambda equals one. Uh, but you also have this broad region of stability in here uh, where you get approximately the right answer, even with the wrong lambda. <clears throat> Uh, once you've got this frequency-dependent uh, polarizability, it's related to many other uh, properties, uh, index of refraction, uh, Raman scattering uh, cross-section. For, for a molecule, we ha have to take into account the perpendicular and parallel components, perpendicular or parallel to the uh, internuclear axis. Uh, Rayleigh scattering cross-section, um, the uh, Verdet constant, which is the constant of proportionality for the, the Faraday effect, which is the, the rotation of the um, plane of polarization uh, for, uh, for a, a gas in a magnetic field. Uh, also, van der Waals interactions, uh, very important to have long range interactions. Uh, <coughs> uh, the, uh, the long range potential is dominated by the uh, this, the C6 term, which you get by integrating over the uh, frequency dependent uh, polarizabilities evaluated at imaginary angle. Gamma is the, is the anisotropy, the difference between the parallel uh, and perpendicular components. Uh, and this is the, uh, uh, one of the early papers where, the, uh, this, uh, where Alex and uh, uh, Chan show that this, this actually works. Uh, here is the, this is the, um, the uh, index of refraction for, for, for helium, the calculated values, the continuous curve, and the points of the experimental data. Uh, and so this uh, was a direct demonstration that this, this really does provide uh, an accurate representation. Um, the, uh, in order to uh, extend this to um, th uh, systems, to, to, do, to get a better representation for the dipole spectrum, um, actually, this is uh, where I became involved with this. Uh, George Victor passed on to me the program that uh, Joanna Taylor had developed to, uh, to, do the, to uh, solve the, the variational problem to find the pseudo spectrum. And so here, here are the, these are the, the, uh, the variational functions containing uh, powers of R1, R2, and R12 uh, times uh, uh, exponentials. And this, this then provides the, uh, and you can show that this is a complete basis set, that as the, 
uh, as the number of terms goes to infinity, that this uh, uh, converges to, this uh, spans Hilbert space. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, in, in those days, because the computers weren't that powerful, a 50-term basis set was a big calculation. Uh, and you can see here the, uh, that the, uh, how the, the first term is the dipole oscillator strength sum rule. The exact answer should be two, or in general, the number of electrons. Uh, and you can see the frequency, the, the, this is that at, at zero frequency uh, is uh, tending to, is converging to a constant value. Uh, I'll talk more about the uh, extension of this to uh, more terms, but this is the most, let's now jump forward uh, about, uh, well, to, this is in, um, uh, to December 2000, uh, with uh, this work by uh, uh, Christoph Bakuski and Jonathan Saperstein, uh, on uh, relativistic and QED corrections. So this is the, the current state of the art uh, where we have the um, uh, relativistic uh, uh, contributions to the, uh, uh, to the polarizability, also mass polarization uh, and, and QED contributions. Uh, the interesting thing that happens, uh, though, is that the final answer uh, is almost the same as the non-relativistic value. That, that you tend, uh, it's quite typically, uh, you, there's a lot of cancellation between mass polarization and relativistic corrections, so that in fact you're better off including neither than including just, just one of them. So, so this is the uh, uh, high precision value for the uh, polarizability of, uh, of helium. Uh, also for uh, van der Bell's interactions, uh, this is a, a relatively recent paper by uh, uh, Zhu Delgarno and uh, de Ribianco. Uh, to calculate this uh, C6 term for the uh, van der Waals interaction, uh, here it is, with, and then the gamma is the, is the anisotropy. And here are the, these uh, dipole, uh, the uh, frequency-dependent polarizability for the parallel and perpendicular components of, of hydrogen, H2, and for, uh, uh, in this case, uh, sodium. Uh, the results, though, uh, haven't really changed that much. They're a little more accurate, but uh, you can see that uh, for with the other atoms, lithium, sodium, and so on down, that, the, that in fact, the, those early estimates were remarkably accurate. Uh, so let's say you want to do a, uh, a high-precision calculation. Of course, the non-relativistic uh, energy is not really useful uh, if, in, in comparison with experiment. Uh, you have to include a wide range of other things, like mass polarization, um, and I'll talk a little more about the, uh, these uh, terms uh, in a few minutes, but the, these other terms depend on the ratio of the reduced electron mass to the nuclear mass. Second order mass polarization, then relativistic corrections, alpha is the fine structure constant. Uh, and so these are smaller by about a factor of, of 10 to the four. Uh, and then relativistic recoil comes in, uh, mu over m is also about 10 to the minus four. So these come in at the in atomic units, 10 to the minus 8 level. And then QED corrections proportional to, to alpha cubed. Um, radiative recoil, this is a, a mass dependent correction to the QED correction. Uh, and then finally, finite nuclear size. And at the end, I'll talk about the application of this to, in fact, determining uh, the nuclear size for halo nuclei. Uh, so the problem uh, then is to solve the uh, the uh, Schrodinger equation, now just, this is just the, the uh, isolated atom without any external field, uh, using this uh, variational basis set that I talked about from the uh, early, work, early work from uh, Victor Delgarno and, uh, and Taylor. It was actually, it was originally suggested first by Hilleras as long ago as 1929 uh, as a, a way of including correlation. So it's the R12, it's an explicitly correlated function because there's this R12 term here. Uh, and in fact, this, is, uh, this allows you to achieve much higher accuracy than would be the case with the more generally applicable methods of atomic physics, such as configuration interaction, Hartree-Fock approximation. It's a specialized technique that works for if you just have a small number of electrons. Uh, and so uh, from the uh, variational, uh, again, from uh, the uh, Rayleigh-Schrodinger variational principle, uh, that then determines it's equivalent to diagonalizing the Hamiltonian uh, in this basis set. Uh, for finite nuclear mass, that brings in this extra mass polarization term that comes from the transformation 
uh, to center of mass plus relative coordinates for the atomic system. Uh, and this is the best studied example, the ground state of, of helium. Here you can see the, the convergence of the uh, answer to about 20 figures uh, as you enlarge the basis set uh, up to about 2,300 uh, terms. Uh, the, uh, and other calculations using other variational methods give the same answer. So that shows that these, these numbers really are meaningful uh, to, the, uh, to, to this many uh, uh, figures. Recently, Charlie Schwartz has, has become active again and, and did, has done this remarkable calculation going out to about 35 terms. Uh, but he had to carry 104 decimal arithmetic uh, in doing the calculation, 104 uh, uh, figure arithmetic. Uh, um, in order to extend, uh, expand the, extend this to the uh, more highly excited states, we've uh, had to introduce this technique of doubling the basis set so that we have explicitly two dis distance scales uh, involved in the, uh, the calculation, um, and, and then a complete optimization of nonlinear parameters. And um, something interesting happens if you, if, when you look at these uh, uh, highly excited states. So here's the sequence going from 10s, 10p, 10d, and so on down to 10k. And by the time you come to the 10k state, you can't see anymore the difference between singlets and triplets. So the exchange term has just gone exponentially fast to zero. Whereas for the S state, I mean, you, you can easily see the singlet triplet splitting. The, uh, the 2.005, that just is the screened hydrogenic energy. So let's see if we can account for the, the remaining terms here. It makes sense out of these remaining digits. Uh, and you can do that with the asymptotic expansion method, the uh, core polarization model, the, uh, we have the uh, polarizable core interacting with a Rydberg electron. So this is a simple physical model. Uh, with the coefficients here, be, uh, you can calculate them exactly uh, for, because uh, you can solve the hydrogen problem. So this is, these all come from these uh, solutions to the uh, perturbation equation. C4 is just a half alpha 1, and we've already agreed that alpha 1 is just 9 over 32. So, uh, and, the, and these expectations, so the, the energy is then the expectation value of this uh, long range uh, potential, and there's also a correction due to the uh, second order term from the solution to the first order perturbation uh, equation. Uh, so, using the methods of uh, uh, Delgarno and Stewart and Cohen and Delgarno, uh, and especially making use of the Delgarno interchange theorem. Uh, and so you can, uh, uh, by adding up all these terms up to the 1 over r to the 10, you then get uh, a complete account of, the, uh, of all the figures uh, in, the, in the direct variational calculation, with the difference being only 3 hertz. And so there's just no point doing variational calculations if you go beyond uh, higher than, than k states, which is L equals 7, because the asymptotic expansion method just becomes so accurate that it's, you can't compete anymore with a, a variational calculation. Uh, in the case of lithium, uh, we have um, uh, the same idea, except we now have powers of R1, R2, R3, R12, R23, and R31. So, and, it, and the thing that makes it difficult to go to even larger basis sets is that you just get killed by the combinatorics. There are just too many ways of adding up these integers as you systematically uh, enlarge the basis set. Also, of course, the integrals get harder and harder to calculate, but it's basically it's the size of the basis set that, that becomes impossible to handle. These are some recent results for the low-lying states of lithium and beryllium plus, where we've uh, succeeded in reaching enough figures to, uh, to match spectroscopic accuracy uh, and use this as a, uh, a way to, um, to calculate high precision values for things like the isotope shift. See, how much time do I have? Okay, you have 10 minutes. 10 minutes, OK. Um, so for relativistic corrections, um, these come in the, uh, from the, uh, the, the, the bright interaction. Uh, what is particularly interesting for the isotope shift, though, are these mass-dependent term, mass-dependent corrections, uh, so-called stone terms, that come from transforming the bright interaction itself from, uh, center, uh, from um, to center of mass plus uh, relative coordinates. <clears throat> it's been dependent terms. Uh, and then these, uh, these are the relativistic recoil terms. Uh, these terms are normally not included at all in atomic structure calculations, but they are essential 
for the isotope shift. And then uh, for the QED shift, the quantum electrodynamics, it's basically like the corresponding Lamb shift for hydrogen, except that you have to put in the correct value for the beta logarithm and the electron density at the nucleus. So, but other than that, this is basically the same thing as the, the, the self-energy uh, contribution uh, for, uh, for, uh, for hydrogen, and, and there's also uh, the uh, vacuum polarization uh, term. Um, this is one of the, but it's turned out to be one of the most difficult things to calculate in atomic physics because of the large contribution from uh, highly excited states. Uh, and uh, so in order to uh, circumvent this problem, so we might say, well, let, why not just use a, uh, a pseudo state representation? Well, the, uh, the difficulty is that the uh, dominant contribution comes from states lying very high in the photoionization continuum, and so the answer just never converges. Um, in order to get around this problem, we've uh, I've introduced this modified pseudo state expansion, uh, which uh, for this audience you might be interested in. I normally don't talk about this in much detail, but uh, I think this is rather interesting. It's a pseudo state expansion with uh, multiple distance scales going down to uh, extraordinarily short distance scales. So just to, uh, so for example, it, it, we build it up in layers. So in the first layer, uh, we'd have e to, the, e to the minus alpha r for, just for hydrogen, then powers of that, and then e to the minus 10 alpha r, e to the minus 100, e to the minus 1,000, and so on up to uh, e to the minus 10 to the 10 or 10 to the 20. Uh, uh, alpha, R, alpha is a, just another parameter of order of magnitude unity, uh, which can also be adjusted. But the point is that this, that you can cover extremely short distance scales, which correspond to extremely high energy. And you could never do this with a, um, a, a finite element type calculation, but you can do it analytically. And, uh, and you can, in fact, diagonalize the Hamiltonian in this uh, rather remarkable basis set uh, and by doing so, you can span the, these are the eigenvalues for the pseudo spectrum going up uh, to, uh, uh, this is uh, up to 10 to the, and this, these are the differential contributions to the, to the beta logarithm. And you can see that you have to go up to 10 to the 8 atomic units just to cover the, uh, the majority of the contribution. Uh, the spectrum goes on up, to, though, to about 10 to the 20 uh, atomic units. And, that, and you have to go up that high in order to get many significant figures in the beta logarithm. Uh, and so uh, and this just shows that it really does work uh, going up to omega. So, this, so the basis that contains e to the minus 10 to the 20 r uh, in, the, in the exponent. Uh, and it uh, converges to the, the extrapolated value, agrees to all these figures with the, with the known value of the beta logarithm. Uh, and so it, it, uh, it, uh, this demonstrates that it really works. Uh, in the case of, of helium, these are the, these are the partial sums, uh, again, going up to 10 to the 6. And here's the asymptotic limit. Uh, so this is the value of the beta logarithm as you include progressively more terms in the pseudo spectrum. Uh, and so you can, in, the, in this way, calculate beta logarithms uh, for all the low-lying states of, of uh, helium and the helium-like ions. Uh, you can also do asymptotic an asymptotic expansion to cover the, the full singly excited spectrum. Um, let me just uh, skip ahead to uh, the finite nuclear size uh, correction and, the, uh, and these uh, very interesting results on uh, halo nuclei. So what's a halo nucleus? A halo nucleus is something like helium-6. So it's an alpha particle with two planetary neutrons. So this is a, a nucleus that looks kind of like an atom. Uh, and, uh, and, and the signature is that the mass radius is a lot bigger than the charge radius, uh, because the, the, uh, the neutrons are part of the mass radius. But the, the, planet, the atomic electrons don't see the neutrons. They only see the, uh, the uh, uh, nuclear, uh, the, the, charge, the alpha particle inside. And so the comparison between the charge and the mass radius provides a sensitive test of the um, of the nuclear structure models that, uh, that, that describe these systems. They, they fall apart easily. You learn a lot about the forces holding them together. Uh, and so here are the contributions to the isotope shift uh, from the non-relativistic energy, first and second order mass polarization. This is the relativistic recoil term. This is in units of megahertz. Uh, the nuclear size contribution is also of the order of one uh, megahertz. 
And here are the, these are the radiative recoil uh, corrections. So you have to know the, you have to know the mass dependent correction to the QED uh, term uh, in order to uh, interpret the experiment. And uh, uh, I think we've established that we have sufficiently good control over the, uh, the accuracy that we can actually use this as a tool to, to measure the size of these, uh, these nuclei. And, and just uh, recently, Tani Hara, who was the original discoverer uh, of, um, of these uh, nuclei, said that he, he never thought that it would be possible to measure the, uh, the charge radius of these things. And uh, so now, now it's been done. Uh, most recent one for helium, helium-8, uh, which lives for uh, uh, you know, se several milliseconds. Uh, and it's just amazing that, uh, that it's possible now to do experiments on these things. They trap the atom in the triplet S state uh, on, the, on the triplet S to triplet P transition and then measure the isotope shift for the two triplet S to three triplet P. Uh, and uh, so here's the uh, resonant uh, signal. Uh, but phys so physically, what's going on? So we've got the, the alpha particle and then the two neutrons. And depending on how, if they're going around opposite, on opposite sides, then the the alpha particle doesn't recoil. If they're going around together, then there's a large recoil of the uh, tightly bound alpha particle. And so the degree to which it moves around uh, and thereby smears out the charge provides an indication of how this whole system is correlated. Uh, and uh, um, you, you need all three particles. Uh, so helium-5, for example, doesn't exist. Uh, so you need, it's, a, it's a, uh, what they call a Borromean system, like the Borromean rings. You need all, you need three particles for it to, for it to stay together. Uh, and so here are the uh, here are results uh, for helium-6 and uh, helium-8. So helium-8 actually gets smaller than he, the charge radius is smaller for helium-8 than it is for uh, helium-6 uh, because the, the four planetary neutrons are, provide a more spherical-like shell. Uh, and uh, and, this, uh, and so it, it, it provides a, um, a, a test of the, of the nuclear models that, um, uh, that provide predi uh, predictions for the size of these, uh, of these structures. Um, these are some other spectroscopic uh, uh, results that have uh, come out of this, a more accurate ionization potential than the, uh, the experimental value. Um, and th this is the, the, the collaboration. This is a, uh, the exper uh, This is the GSI collaboration, um, <coughs> which uh, di uh, uh, did similar experiments on uh, on lithium. Lithium 11 is the next um, halo nucleus, uh, and this uh, is a, a, a plot of the complete range. So we now have results going all the way from helium helium 3, helium 4, right through lithium uh, to and just recently. Uh, uh, just submitted a paper on, uh, on um, the nuclear uh, radius for, for beryllium-11, which is the first case of a single neutron halo. Uh, and the, the significant thing about this is that all the theories agree with the experiment for the stable cases, helium-3, helium-4, and pretty much so for lithium-6, lithium-7. But the, the, the halo nuclear, the, the theoretical predictions just Fan, or the, theory, the nuclear theory just fans out uh, with a wide range of, uh, of values, and so this provides uh, a, a test of, uh, of which ones uh, we can. So we can tell the nuclear theorists who's right and who's wrong. Yeah, and these are the brand new results for uh, for beryllium, uh, going all the way from beryllium seven through to beryllium uh, eleven. Um, so I guess I'm approaching the end of my, uh, my time, so uh, uh, I don't really have time to talk about the extension of this to helium-like ions using whatever Z expansion theory, um, uh, which provides good agreement with the experiment and also with uh, Walter Johnson's um, calculations based on uh, many-body perturbation theory, relativistic CI-type calculations. Uh, I was going to... Uh, talk about the Chen, Chang, and Johnson uh, work, um, and the extension of this work to, to higher order QED, uh, relativistic and QED uh, corrections. Uh, so let me just uh, uh, conclude with uh, a, a few more references. To, I said I would talk about uh, helium plus uh, energies and polarizabilities of hydrogen molecular ions. 
This is some work for, uh, from Zong Chao Yan uh, and, uh, and his, uh, his collaborators. Um, <clears throat> so these are uh, energies for the ground state of, uh, of, of H2 plus. So we can now similarly achieve very high accuracy, but there's no Born-Obenheimer approximation. This is just treating uh, H2 plus as if it were a, th a three-body system with, with, the, with the, the electron playing the role of a very light nucleus and two, uh, and the two uh, protons being, being heavy uh, electrons. Uh, and, and you could, and you, so the same kind of technique converges to many figures, uh, including values for the, uh, the dipole polarizability of H2 plus, D2 plus, T2, and so on. Uh, so this can now also be calculated to very high precision uh, and compared with, um, and these are uh, the, the most, most recent values uh, from, from Yan uh, and his group, uh, and uh, uh, including relativistic corrections to the dipole polarizability. And there's an in interesting issue involved here that I, I just wanted to mention that when you, that this has also been measured by Steve Lundin uh, and his group by measuring the energies of the Rydberg states of H2. So you put one electron into a high Rydberg state and then watch how it interacts with the polarizable uh, H2 plus core. And from that, uh, and by analyzing that spectrum, you can deduce the value of the polarizability. Uh, and the, the uh, interesting conclusion here is that there's a, a, a remaining discrepancy between theory and experiment that, uh, that when you include, here's the experimental value, 3.16796 with relativistic corrections, 3.16857. So, uh, so there's, um, uh, there's a, a non-relativistic 3.16872 that comes down to 5.7 as compared with uh, seven nine, so the, the, it only accounts for about uh, one fifth of the discrepancy between theory and experiment. And so the the speculation is that uh, that the here's Taylor, Delgado, and Babb's calculation. So this is still an active area for uh, for research, uh, and the speculation is that the that the Casimir-Polder effect, here the Casimir-Polder effect. Uh, uh, the, the analysis does not include this, and so uh, that's uh, something that, uh, that to, uh, should be looked at: is whether or not there are remaining uh, corrections. That uh, perhaps there's some new physics here that hasn't really been properly taken into account. Um, relativistic correction. So again, uh, these, uh, this is the most recent work, 2008, by uh, Korobov. Um, and we, so here's this uh, remarkable agreement between theory and experiment uh, out to the sub megahertz level for the, uh, this is for the 0, 2 to 4, 3 v, uh, uh, transition, rho, rho vibrational transition of HD plus. Uh, the significance of this is that uh, it, uh, it will provide, uh, this high precision comparison will provide a, a method to determine the the uh, electron to proton mass ratio. So this will feed into the determination of the fundamental constants. Uh, and so uh, just to conclude, uh, atomic and molecular theory continues to provide key input data for a number of other areas of physics, especially astrophysical applications. I didn't get the chance to talk at all about oscillator strengths, and especially theory of forbidden transitions, one of the most fruitful areas where I have personally collaborated with, uh, with Alex. Uh, fascinating uh, area, and I'll try and put that into the written proceedings, but uh, uh, I just couldn't cover it in, in the time I have available. Uh, and also the combination of high precision theory with experiment uh, provides opportunities to develop new measurement tools. I think this is an especially important aspect of the continuing development of uh, atomic physics, uh, that it, it allows you to measure things in uh, alternative ways, uh, or to supplement data available from other, uh, uh, other means, such as the, the electroweak interaction, cosmological variation of the fundamental constants. So there's many areas of interest remain, remaining, and there remain important challenges ahead in pushing beyond lithium with high precision variational calculations of the same uh, sort that we've been talking about. Oh, I've got a Delgarno quote. Let's see what that is. Uh, I don't know if it's an actual quote, but I think, it, uh, I think I learned it from him, that the key to successful theor theoretical work is always to have more than one way of doing the same thing. So I'll conclude there. Mm -hmm.
Many thanks, Gordon, for that. Uh, that's just <laughs> superb stuff, particularly that uh, nuclear halo. <laughs> yeah, it really, really is fascinating. And it's fantastic yeah. to see how theory can actually achieve this fantastic precision. And in some ways, it'll help to keep these experimentalists honest also. Oh, yeah. uh, well, at least it's uh, keeping them busy. <laughs> it's keeping them busy and keep them honest, and uh, it'll keep them appreciating mm. theories like yours mm. uh, into, into the far future. So what I would like to do now is uh, I'll open it up to questions. We do have some time left. Gordon just finished dead on time. Mm -hmm. So if there's any questions, uh, we can... Uh, Take care of them. Okay. Who's that? Yes. Very interesting. Uh, how was it developed? Uh, I mean, did you look at the wave functions? I didn't do the uh, nuclear physics part of it. That was done but by. Um, the uh, group, at, uh, ma the main group is the is the one at Argonne National Lab. But, so the the helium six helium, pl uh, so it's uh, uh, Steve Piper and Waringa. Do you know the, how they know that the, the 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 two neutrons are sort of moving uh, collectively? Uh, uh, how do they? Well, I mean, they would yeah. do a correlated calculation, like a configuration interaction. I mean, there are different models with different. Uh, what, some of them involve cl uh, clusters. So, you, I mean, you treat the alpha particle as so, a, cl so as a cluster the and then have the two neutrons. Uh, so you construct a three-body uh, three uh, wave function so they look at uh, the wave with function. a polarizable uh, structure for it. I mean, that would be a good approximation. To, uh, and then, of course, you have uh, excitations of the, of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of the alpha particle would also enter into a complete calculation. But the significant point is it provides a test of the effect of low energy nucleon nucleon interaction potential. And so it provides insight into the properties of all nuclear matter, whether it's a neutron star, so there's the connection with uh, astronomy that uh, this tells you something about uh, properties of neutron stars also, as well as uh, nuclei, atomic nuclei. Well, uh, I guess you're all frightened off by this fantastic <laughs> precision that Gordon, uh, nothing can beat this precision, <laughs> I think, Gordon. So I would love to thank our speaker again, once again, for such a fine talk. <laughs>